There are many amazing inheritance stories. Uh, there's the story of the wealthy Portuguese man who left his for, uh, fortune to 70 total strangers who he randomly picked from a, f- a phone directory. Imagine that. Uh, there's the story of uh, New York billionaire Leona Helmsley. She was nicknamed the Queen of Mean. She uh, left $12 million to her dog. So she was mean to everyone, I guess, except for her dog. And there's the story of Canadian Charles Vance Miller. Maybe you heard of this one. He left part of his estate to the Toronto woman who would give birth to the most children during the 10 years following his death. And this contest was uh, called the Great Stork Derby. In the end, there were four winning mothers who had given birth to nine children during those 10 years, and they each received $110,000. And this was back like 1920s or 30s, so that would have been a lot of money. Those are all incredible inheritance stories. But I think that the most incredible inheritance story is the story that we find in the Bible. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15. It says, So that those who are called, called by God to salvation, may receive the promised eternal inheritance. The promised eternal inheritance. If you look at the first part of verse 15, it says, Therefore he, Jesus, is the mediator of a new covenant. So without Jesus, there would be no new covenant. What is the new covenant? Well, really, the new covenant is Christianity. The new covenant is Christianity. If you remember what Jesus said in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 25, this, this cup, the cup of the Lord's Supper, is the new covenant in my blood. So that cup represents the blood of Jesus. And what he was saying was that the promise of a new covenant, which included the forgiveness of sins, would be fulfilled by the shedding of his blood. In other words, by his death, which would be a death on a cross. And so without that blood, there would not be a new covenant, which was promised in Jeremiah 31. There would be no Christianity without the blood of Jesus. As it says in verse 22, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And so without Jesus, there would be no new covenant. There would be no Christianity. There would be no true forgiveness of sins without his blood shed on the cross. Now the promise of an inheritance, which uh, verse 15 speaks of, this promise of an inheritance really originated with an earlier covenant. The writer of Hebrews has talked about the old covenant, which he calls the first covenant, in the sense that it preceded the new covenant, but actually there was a covenant before that, a covenant God made with Abraham. We call it today the Abrahamic covenant. And so this promise of an inheritance originated in this Abrahamic covenant, and it was fulfilled by the new covenant. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. Here we read of this covenant between God and Abraham. Abraham would become the father of the nation of Israel. In Genesis 12, verse 3, God says, In you, all the families or all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. So through Abraham, blessing would come to people of all nations. 
And then we go over to chapter 17 of Genesis and verse 8. God says to Abraham, And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So this Abrahamic covenant included a promise about blessing to come to all nations through Abraham, and it also included a promise about an inheritance, land, the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. Now let's go over to the Apostle Paul's letter to the Galatians. Galatians chapter 3. And Paul speaks about those verses in the book of Genesis. Talks about what God said to Abraham, what he promised. Galatians 3 and verse 8. And the scripture, talking about Genesis 12 verse 3, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So what Paul is saying is that when God gave to Abraham this promise, he was preaching the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And then we go down to verses 16 through 19. Now the promises, the promises to Abraham, that were made to Abraham, and to his offspring... Uh, it does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. So he's saying that this promise would be fulfilled by Christ, the promise of blessing, and the promise of an inheritance. Verse 17, this is what I mean. The law, which is another name for the old covenant that God gave to the nation of Israel through Moses in the book of Exodus, the law which came 430 years afterward, after God's promises to Abraham, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. So he's saying this promise to Abraham is still good. Verse 19, for if the inheritance comes by the law, Verse 18, it, is no longer, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. What then, or why then, the law? What, what was the purpose of the law? Paul is asking. He says, it was added because of transgressions, because of sins, until the offspring, that's Christ, should come to whom the promise has been made. And so he says here, the reason why God gave this old covenant, the law, was really to show people their sinfulness and their need of a Savior, their need of the Christ to come, the offspring of Abraham. Of course, Jesus was born a Jew. We go over to uh, the book of Hebrews again, chapter 11. The writer here talks about Abraham. Hebrews 11, verse 8, By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. There's that word, inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land. The land didn't belong to him at that point. It would never, but to his offspring after him. Uh, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Verse 13, these all died in faith, Abraham included, not having received the things promised but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Now verse 16. 
But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he, was prepared, for he has prepared for them a city. So what the writer of Hebrews here, and what Paul as well is saying, is that when God gave these promises to Abraham, he was talking more, more than just about the offspring being the nation of Israel. He was speaking of Christ. When he talked about land, he was talking about more than just the land of Canaan. He was talking about a heavenly city. And so these promises are not just for Abraham's physical descendants. These promises are for anyone, people of all nations, who put their faith in the offspring of Abraham, who is Jesus Christ. It is a promise for us all. Look at the end of verse 15, going back to Hebrews chapter 9. The end of verse 15. We read part of it already. So that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant, the old covenant, the law. And it seems when he brings up this word inheritance, the writer of Hebrews, in verse 15, he talks about this inheritance, and it seems as though it causes him to think about a will. In verse 16, for where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. Now, it's, it's uh, important not to press an analogy too far. The point he's making is that a death has occurred, the death of Jesus, which means that we can now receive this inheritance. Verse 17 for a will takes effect only at death, since it is not enforced, not in force, as long as the one who made it is alive. You don't receive an inheritance unless someone dies. Jesus has died, so now we can receive this inheritance. It makes it possible. The death of Jesus makes it possible for people to receive an eternal inheritance. But what is this eternal inheritance? That the death of Jesus makes possible. Remember what God said to Abraham in Genesis 17, verse 8. He said, I will be their God. And remember what the promise of the new covenant said. Back in chapter 8 of Hebrews, second part of verse 10. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. We often call our inheritance heaven. We talk about being able to go to heaven one day because Jesus died for our sins. And that's true. But our inheritance is more than just a place. Our inheritance really is a person. Uh, When we talk about, when people talk about going home, maybe going home for Thanksgiving or Christmas, what we look forward to is not just going to a house, going to a place. We're looking forward to going to be with, with people, with family. And so when we talk about going to heaven, that should mean more to us than we're merely going to a place of peace and joy and love. It should mean more than that. It should mean that we're going to be with a person, God himself. Heaven is also a person. If you go to Revelation chapter 21, Verses 3 and 4. John's vision of the heavenly city. Remember, Abraham was looking to this, or for this, heavenly city. Not merely the land of Canaan, but a heavenly land, a heavenly city. 
Verse 3, And I heard a voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. I think sometimes we skip over verse 3 and we focus on verse 4, which talks about all of the bad things of this life being no more. But when we do that, we reveal that we're not really appreciating the best part of heaven. As George Guthrie in his uh, commentary on Hebrews writes, heaven is ultimately the place of God's presence fully known, fully experienced. That really is what heaven is about. That God is with his people. We'll go over to chapter 22 of Revelation as well. Verse 4, it says, They will see his face. They will see the face of God in that heavenly city. And I'm reminded of what God told Moses in Exodus chapter 33, verse 20. When Moses wanted to see the glory of God, God told him, you can't see my face and live. And that's because we can't be in the presence of a holy God with sin a part of us. You cannot see my face and live. But Revelation 22, verse 4 says, they will see the face of God. To be honest, I don't fully understand what it will mean to see the face of God. Of course, we can understand what it means to see the face of Jesus because God the Son became human. We'll be able to see him face to face. But what will it mean to see the face of God, the Father, who is spirit? I confess that I don't completely understand that. But I believe it will be an experience like no other experience. People often say things like, you haven't really lived until you've, you've tried that pie, or you haven't really lived until you've, you've gone to that beautiful place. Well, what I would say is that we really haven't lived until we've seen the face of God. What I mean is that this is what we were made for. We were made to know God. And we really haven't lived as God intended until we see the face of God. As Psalm 1611 says, In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. You haven't really lived until you've seen the face of God. That is our hope. Not just the hope of a perfect place, but the hope of being with God himself. That inheritance is possible because of the death of of Jesus. It's available to people of all nations, to, to anyone who will put their faith in Jesus Christ. And so I would urge each one to receive forgiveness of sins, the hope of this inheritance through faith in Jesus. Really, this promise of an eternal inheritance frees us from being crushed by earthly disappointments. This life really can be seen sometimes as just a series of disappointments. One disappointment after another. But when we have this hope, this hope of an eternal inheritance, it, it frees us from being crushed by earthly uh, disappointments. You know, I might not 
reach that goal that I've set. All of my dreams for this life might not come true. For some of us, life will end shorter than we expected. Uh, for some of us, we'll struggle financially throughout all of our days. Maybe our marriage won't go as we had hoped, or maybe our family won't be as we had hoped. Life has these disappointments, but what the Bible tells us is that we have hope, not just in this life, but in the life to come. Because of the death of Jesus, we have this inheritance through faith in him. We have this hope of heaven, which is not just a place, but it is a person. We will see the face of God. And when we, when we think upon this, in the midst of our difficulty, it allows us not to be crushed by the disappointments we face right now. And so there are many amazing inheritance stories, but I would say the most amazing inheritance story is the story of our inheritance in Jesus Christ.